Shalom, shalom, blessings and peace to all the um, brothers and sisters who may be listening in. This is um, Brother Yahar, and I am going to be presenting a little teaching on the Hebrew grammar. It is important to know Hebrew since that is what the scriptures are written in. It's at least in the old, um, what we call the Old Testament, I guess. So anyway, um, let's, let's get into it. The actual subtopic or the topic of this Hebrew grammar is going to be entitled the imperative Hebrew verb conjugation. The imperative Hebrew verb conjugation. Okay, now just to let you know what imperative, um, some of you all may know what imperative means, but it actually is um, a verb that is used to express a direct command, a direct command, all right? And it can also be used to grant permission or to communicate a request of some sort, right? And it occurs only in the second person, whether it's singular or plural. It only appears in Hebrew in the second person, singular or plural. And so that's what the topic or that's what we're going to be focusing on. And the best example I could get um, for this um, was found in the book of Genesis, Better Seek, um, chapter nine. And we're going to go over that. So um, I must say before I get into it, that those of you that know me, know that I am not a fluent Hebrew speaker. I am a student of the Hebrew language, and that is my capacity. All right, I have been fortunate enough to be taught by a very good more whose name is Mitz, is what we go, his name is Mitz. And also Shah Benoit is another good Hebrew uh, more And we all seem to be students, but... Um, you may hear me say things that may not be exactly the right pronunciation, and that's okay. Um, just bear with, because what we're going to go over is how to identify certain things in the grammar so you can understand the meaning. I can do that. I may not be as fluent because I don't speak it fluently to be able to um, be perfect in the pronunciation. And I have that same problem with English being from Mississippi. I don't say some words the way they probably supposed to sound, you know. So anyway, with that, let's just get into this lesson. And um, again, it is um, the topic is going to be the imperative Hebrew verb conjugation. All right. And so I'm going to go to, to Genesis chapter nine. And just to let you know, my source material, um, this is just um, for English, since most of us and those of that are listening may not be able to understand Hebrew when it's just spoken fluently or read fluently. So you still have to rely upon the English. But I encourage each and every one as I encourage myself to continue my studies in the Hebrew language so that we may become fluent in the language where we can read the Hebrew text a lot more easier and it's more um, unadulterated when we read it that way. So Anyway, that's my encouragement to you. That's the source material here, which is a King James Version. And also, we're going to look in the um, actual Sefer, okay, which is right here. I have a Sefer that we're going to be making a comparison because both of those are English texts of the Hebrew scriptures. And we will see which one is more accurate. Um, you may be able to tell that as we go through. So let's just get into it. Let me read, first of all, the book of um, Genesis chapter 9. We're going to do verse 1, and we're going to do verse 7. Now, notice verses 1 through 7. This is, um, this is the Most High that is speaking um, to Noah and his three sons, and he's given them certain things. Now, we're going to, not going to cover everything from verse 2 through 6, but it's important. If you want to read it, you can read it. But we're going to focus on verse 1, which is here, and we're going to um, actually parse out, if you would, verse 7. All right? And so what it says in verse one, and God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, 
be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. All right. So now we know what the audience is. We see that the Most High is speaking most likely through a messenger, an angelic being, um, to actual Noah and his sons. And we know who his sons are, which is Ham, Shem, and Japheth. And he's, this is after the deluge, the flood, has already occurred. And now they have exited out of the ark. And he's now given them specific instructions. All right, now let's skip down to verse 7. And it says here, And you be fruitful and multiply. Bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. Okay? And that's just kind of like a repeat of what is here in verse 1. All right? So that's what we're going to focus on and we're going to break this down. But before we do that, let's look in the Sefer and see if there are any noticeable differences of what is put in the Sefer concerning those same two verses. So we're going to go to, again, it's called Better Seat. Better Seat, that means in the beginning. Okay, Better Seat, which is also translated in English to mean Genesis. All right, and we're going to go to chapter 9. And we're going to read verse 1 and 7 like we did in the King James Version. And it says, And Elohim blessed at Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish at the earth. Okay. Notice you got this, these two characters here in Hebrew. And it, it equals as far as it is sounded. It's um, the way it sounds is eth. Okay. And we see here Elohim replaces and God um, in, it was in the King James Version and everything else is pretty much the same as in the King James Version. OK, and this F is that, you know, is a direct object. So that's what it's um, speaking directly to is what this actually means. Other brothers may have a different understanding of what this means, but that's my understanding of that. Et. And we'll see how it is used when we go to the Hebrew. So remember this. This et right here, okay? All right. And let's go to verse number um, seven, as we did in the King James Version. And we see here, and you be fruitful and multiply. Bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. Okay. And that again is like a repeat of verse one. Um, just give, and that's what we're going to actually parse out. All right. Now, let's now look at the Hebrew text. Now, looking at the Hebrew, we'll see that we are in the book of Better Sheet, which is called Genesis, which means in beginning. Okay, and that's it rendered in English. And we're going to go again to chapter 9, which is here. And we're going to go verse 1. And we're also going to skip over to verse 7, which is found over here. It's in the highlights for you. Okay, so let's just go with Genesis Chapter 9, verse 1, and we see here, pardon the shadows that may appear on the page, but hopefully you can follow me. Um, we have Weberek, and this means, and he blessed. Who blessed? Elohim. Elohim, and he blessed. So that's who is speaking. That's who's doing the blessing. Elohim. Et Noach. Et Noach. That's and Noah. Noah's that... Um, that marker, that, that marker we were talking about before, the direct object marker, that et that appeared in the Sefer. All right. So we have Weberek, Elohim, et nok, and this is wet, Benu, Benu. All right. That means and, the direct marker. That's the conjunction and, direct marker, speaking about his sons, all right? That's what Benu is, his sons. Okay, we have Way Yamur. Way Yamur, that means, and he said, Lahim, which is to them, Paru. That means, and we get into that, Paru. It means, be fruitful. Wubaru, and multiply, Wu. Milu, Yumilu, and fill et ha'erts. Notice you got that direct marker again we saw in the Sefer, which is et ha'erts, which is mean the earth. All right, 
or the land. Ha'eres is the right way to pronounce that. Ha'eres. Et ha'eres. So again, let's go to verse 7, which we're going to be parsing out here. And we have, <clears throat> let me get a focus for you. There we go. Okay, we have Wetim, Paru, what is that? Yerubu. Okay, so that's again, we, again, we're going to go over this in a second. So let me just keep going. Sherizu, Bayert, Yerubu, Ba. Okay, and again, we're going to go over each one of these words so you can see it. Let's just hit it one more time. So, Batim, Paru, Yerubu, Shirizu, Bayers, Yerubu, Ba. Okay? So, we're going to go over this and what it actually means, and we're going to parse out the grammar. So, let's get to that. All right, let's, let's get into the Hebrew and, and, and break it down. Um, and first, let me just say again that... If you want to understand the Hebrew scriptures, right, and I do, especially when there are any disputes about what the meaning of something is and what is it trying to say, it, it, it behooves one to, to take up some study in the Hebrew language. And I must say that I'm still learning, as I spoke about before. I don't know it all. I'm not professing to be a expert. Um, in the Hebrew language, I just understand how it functions. And I was taught that by my more mitz. And I would advise each and every one of you, if you're interested and want to get understanding of Hebrew, to do so. Get in touch with a more who can teach the language properly. And <clears throat> anyway, and first of all, make sure you know the alphabet. All right. Because everything I'm going to go over now, if you don't understand the alphabet, then it may not make sense to you. And just get the alphabet down, understand how certain words are. Because we all know certain words like ah, you know, and shalom or shalom or different uh, words that we use in our everyday communications with each other. But it, it's more to it. It's a lot more to it. So with this, let's just get into it. And I want to explain this board to you a little bit so you can understand what's going on. You see this line here that goes all the way across this top line. And then there's a bottom line that goes all the way across, right? All the way across. Now, everything that's in between these two lines is the, the text that we're going to go over, which is Genesis Better Sheep, chapter 9, verse 7. And those of you that have paleo, open it up to this same um, scripture, and you will see this is how it's rendered in the paleo. All right, and notice I have this is the actual scripture, okay, and then I have above each one of the the renderings this first word conjugation, if you would, or first word arrangement. It has a root word, and I have the roots up here. This is a root for the first word, which is right here. This is a root for the second word, third word, and so forth. All right. And then I have the fifth and the sixth word that is right here. All right. Also have the different scripts that you have. You have here the picto. Those who have picto renderings, you can look at it as well. Those who have paleo, this is in the middle. I guess this is red. In the green, we have the picto. And in the black, we have the so-called modern um, script of Hebrew, right? It is not Yiddish. Please don't confuse the two, but that's a whole different lesson. All right. But um, and you will find that the letters match up, uh, whether you're using your paleo text um, or using your modern text. I'm using the modern text. That's what I have. But I can understand and read paleo as well. And you can do the same as well. So, um Let's get into it. So the, the first word that we had in verse 7 was watim, all right, which is right here, watim, watim in the paleo. And I have in front of it um, a different color 
because what's in black is the root, all right? And if it's another color that precedes it or follows it, that means that that is either a prefix or it is, it is either a suffix that has some meaning, okay? So the first word in that scripture was Watson, right? And it means, and you. So let's look at the root of that. And the root is simple. It is an independent pronoun. All right, it's an independent pronoun, second masculine plural. Okay, second masculine plural. And we know this by when we were reading it from the text that it was second masculine plural because someone was speaking to someone else directly, right? That was the Elohim was speaking to Noah, right? Or Noah and his sons. So that made it more than one in the audience. So that makes it a second masculine plural, right? Okay, so this is again the root um, atim, which is an independent pronoun. It means you in the second masculine plural sense, all right? So right here, going back to the text that appeared, we have this character here. What does that mean? It's a prefix. It, it comes before the root. It comes before the root. Before I go on, let me just mention this as well. In most all of Hebrew, especially in the verbs, all of the verbs have what is known as a shorish. A shorish is a three letter, three consonants that have meaning when they are put together. All right. And this, we know we read Hebrew from what? Right to left. We know we read English from left to right, but we're in Hebrew. So we're reading these characters. This is the first position, the first consonant, the second position and the third position. So these are called the first root, the second root, and the third root, right? So this is what is known as a shorish. And mostly you will find these in a, um, even though it's an independent pronoun, we'll get to the verbs in a minute to talk about the A-class vowels that a lot of brothers use, only the A-class vowels, and they think that is the ancient Hebrew. But it's actually symbolic of the uh, not symbolic, it actually represents the third masculine singular, what we call the G stem. The, um, we'll get to that when we get to the first verb. Anyway, let's keep moving with the actual um, first conjugation we had here, which was Watim. When you have this um, in front, this is a, a, um, a wa, it's a con conjunction. It means and. And this is the independent pronoun that we found out here, which means the second masculine plural independent pronoun. So, and you. So you have this and here, and you. So he's speaking to um, an audience or more than one individual. So that puts it in the plural state. All right. So why Tim? Let's go to the second one. This is our first verb, right? We have um, be ye fruitful. And this is um, Peru. Peru, all right, and this is in the paleo, and we go to the root. The root is here. Notice the root is a little different. You have para, para. These are the A-class vowels you see here, para. So when people look at the Strong's Concordance, it gives you a lot of the A-class, the G root, or the G stem root radical of the um, Shoresh, um, which is always in a third masculine singular. When it's, when it's speaking of those, and but when we go into the text, we see that it's a little different. Do you notice the difference? In this, Peru versus Para, it's in the third root, all right? One, two, three, it's in the third root. You have a hey in the root, which means to bear fruit and be fruitful. That is a verb, third masculine singular called perfect, right? But here, it's a little different. And that gets us to the topic of what the lesson is about. By having this third um, character changed from a he to a wa has significance. This is now in a plural state and it is imperative. Whenever you have this wu at the end, peru, wu at the end, that means it is given a direct command. All right. And it's talking in the 
um, second masculine plural. Okay, this is third masculine singular with the he at the end, but when you change this to a u, you still have the same meaning, fruitful, but now it's saying be you, fruitful, because it's talking plural, and it's giving it a command that makes it imperative. So whenever you see this at the end of a verb, you know that it is given an imperative, so this will be considered a call um, imperative by, by just seeing this simple change from a he to a wa that has the, the u sound. This is what that punctuation mark means. When you look in your paleo, you're not going to have a he at the end. You're going, like you have here, you're going to find in your text, you're going to have that u at the end. Peru, all right? Be you fruitful. Why is it um, you? That's the you, the plural part. Be you fruitful. And you be you fruitful. Let's go to the next one. Yurubu. Yurubu. That means, and you multiply. Again, going to the, you notice you have something in front, meaning a prefix, and you have something changed of the third radical or the third root radical, right? So we'll go to the root of this. And we'll see Rabbah. This is Rabbah. This is a root, which means to become many, to multiply, to be great, to increase in number, um, to become much. Okay. And it's in the third masculine singular to qual perfect. All right. But notice again, you have a he. And just like in this verb here, you have a he. Whenever you have a he that's at the end, it's called a third. Um, third he, meaning the third um, root is changed to a wa when you go to and let me go back over here. I'm at the wrong word here. When you go into rubu, you have this he change just like you had it here because this is still what? This is still part of the command that he's telling them to be fruitful and also telling them to multiply and you be fruitful and you multiply. So that's the change. Now you wouldn't know this. Now, normally when you're just talking in a sense of changing this from a third masculine singular to a third masculine plural, you're going to find this at the end. You're going to find Tim at the end, just like you found it in the independent pronoun when it went to, in, when it went to second masculine plural. You see this, this Tim at the end? That's the same thing that would follow a verb if you're just speaking to um, the same group of people. But what changes is when you are giving them an imperative, a, a command, a direct command. All right. So that's why it's so important to understand this and be able to verbalize it or to be able to phonetically sound it out where you're making the sound correctly because you're not saying ruba because that's talking to a third person, right? You're talking to um, second person, plural. Hope this makes sense in Rubu. So let's go to the next word, um, which is Shirizu. Shirizu. Shirizu means you swarm. And let's look at the root word here, which is Shiraz. Shiraz. Shiraz is the right way to pronounce it. Shiraz, Shiraz, all right? That's the way we pronounce it. And it means it's a verb in the qual. Is, again, that's where you have the A-class vowels. And just like you have when people are speaking A-class vowels, everything has an A behind the consonant. This is because it's in a third masculine singular. But what if you're changing that to um, a second masculine singular? Let's look and see. You see that it still has this mark. It's that he has been changed or it hasn't been changed. This wu has been added. You don't change the he because it doesn't have a he at the end. It has a z at the end. Okay. So you have the actual root, which is here, which is the same root that is here. This is different than the other verb that ended in a third he at the end. That's when you change that to a wa. In this case, you just add the wa to the end, and you have a u sound, shirizu, shirizu, all right? 
and that means to swarm or you swarm all right the root means to swarm or to fill or to just like when you have roaches and rats and things that make that comes in a swarm that means they everywhere and that's what the command was to be fruitful to multiply and become many or to to increase and swarm and fill all right let's go to the next word buyers 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 let's look at the root because you have four four characters going on here so we got to parse it out we got to see what's going on so let's go to the root the root of this is found here which is eris eris which means the earth it also can mean a region or land a certain land it doesn't actually have to always mean the entire earth but in this case it is meaning the earth um, in its entirety, at least that's my understanding of it. Some brothers may understand it. It was only a regional thing, a regional flood. And that's the only thing they were supposed to feel was just a certain area. All right. This is a feminine noun. Okay. It is a feminine noun. And we'll get to why in a second. We'll get to that next word. But eres, eres means earth or land. That's the root. That's the third shoresh, eres. All right. So when we go back to Baers, which is here, notice you have um, a prefix that's here. What does this prefix mean? Some brothers know that when you, and sisters know when you have a ba, a bet that's in front, that means, we pronounce it a ba, but it's a bet is the actual alphabet, the letter that it is. Um, it means, it's a preposition. It's not a conjunction like we had in the wa, this prefix is a preposition that means in, in earth, all right, in earth. So that's what, that's separated. If it didn't have this in front, you just said heirs, it's, you swarm earth. Don't make sense. You have to say in earth, all right? And we know from verse one, it had a hay in between here, which means in the earth. So that is the understanding when you read this, that it's still speaking of the same thing that verse one was speaking of, which is Baeris. And in verse one is Bahaeris, okay? And in the, and then most people say Bahashim. That's what, you know, the Ba means in, Ha means the, Shem means name, in the name of, you know, Bahashim. You know, y'all are familiar with that phrase, so that's the same here. You can grasp the same meaning. Baha Eris means in the earth. By Eris just means in earth. All right. So let's um, go to the last, because we already went over um, Yorubu, which is here again. And it says, and you multiply. We're going to come back to this word in a moment, just like we're going to go back to the word um, Shirizu in a moment. But just to finish this parsing out, we, go to, we already did the Yorubu, so we don't have to do that again. Let's go to the last and the final, um, which is the sixth word in this in this scripture, which is ba. Okay, now this going at the root, you, we see that we have two characters. The ba it means in, just like we was, saw the in earth here. This means in it, but this it is this ba here is a independent. Um, excuse me, a pronominal su suffix that means it in a feminine sense. So it's third feminine singular. Why is it feminine? Because it's talking about the feminine noun in the earth. So it has to agree with one another. You can't have a masculine um, phrase here. And, and I'm speaking of a feminine um, noun. You, it just wouldn't make sense. So this pronominal suffix is... Um, Third feminine singular, meaning the earth. Okay, so that is how that is all parsed out. And you see the, again, the uh, ba, which is here, ba, and it means in it. Because you have the preposition, which is in, and you have the pronominal suffix at the end, the he, which is third feminine singular, meaning in it, meaning in her, being a feminine to the earth, which is a feminine noun. Okay, so um, let's now look at these two words here because there's some special footnotes about these two words, which is the Yorubu that's found here and also the 
shirizu that is found here. Let's look at the um, shirizu. This is, I'm going to be very quick on this, but before I get to this, I forgot to mention at the end of this appears a punctuation, which ends after verse 7, uh, verses 1 through 7. So that means they all go together and you have a punctuation, which is a psalmic, which is his psalmic is the right way to pronounce it. I guess psalmic um, that is at the end. It's a punctuation that is given accent. Um, so it's accentuating the whole seven verses um, that preceded this punctuation mark. So all of that grouping goes together. Verses one through verses seven go together and it's punctuated at the end. OK, um, so I just wanted to bring that out. And now let's go to um, certain footnotes that were found concerning Sharizu. Sharizu. Um, the, in, in most of the texts you have, um, this is what appears in the Hebrew text. But there is one in the Versonis, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Versonis, I think is the right way to say it. But anyway, that particular one has a wa in front of it, just like here. So it would be reading, be you fruitful and you multiply and you swarm. Because in this text, it doesn't have that conjunction wa in front. But in one text, it does have the wa. But it's still the same essence of the meaning is not changed. We know what the what what is rendered and you be fruitful and multiply like most of the text when they transfer to English, they take out the you, even though the you is present here. And they take out the you here and they just put swarm. So what it say, be you, look at your text, it says, be you fruitful and multiply and um, swarm in the earth or in earth and so I just want to bring that out that in one text you have a wa here that shows just like it has here so you have a wu sizru um, um, that would be rendered for that I guess so anyway I just want to bring that out and now let's look at one other interesting at least I found it to be interesting about this other Yorubu that's here because, you know, this is interesting and, and scholars have looked at this and they have offered this to you. And I seem to subscribe to what they're saying, because this instead of this root word being Rabah. OK, that's right here. Instead of being Rabah, the second root has a delet, a D sound, a da, 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 da sound. So it's Rada. And that word, interesting enough, means to rule, to dominate, to have dominion over. And, and that's just really interesting because we see here they already have and you be you fruitful and multiply here. Why is multiply again mentioned here? Could it have possibly been an error in rendering in this one consonant? In this second root radical, so instead of being Rabah, could it have been Rada? Hmm. Because if it does, it would make sense, and it has some supporting evidence. It has a, a, some supporting evidence that I just want to offer it to you. Um, that's when we go to the book of Genesis, and we're going to go there in a second, and we're going to read um, from the first chapter um, where this dominion is being used or this rulership. So if just to bear with me for a second, because we were to read it now and say, and you be fruitful and you multiply swarm, you swarm in earth and have dominion in it or to rule in it. Is that strange? Let's take a look. Okay, let's just look at this closer and see if the scholars have a, a good point that they are bringing. And again, we're discussing um, this imperative that is found here in Warubu, um, meaning, and you multiply, uh, second masculine plural, um, which is also found in the beginning of um, verse 7 of Bereshit, which is Genesis chapter 9. And we know that the root word is Rabah, right? As we found out, Rabah. 
you see a Rabbah. And what we're trying to ask is we should replace this character here with a Dilet, a D. And if that would take on a different meaning, that would make this whole scripture more complete and more accurate. So let's just examine it. So again, pay close attention to this second root radical here, which is the, um, the um, bet changed to a delet. So let's just look at it real quick. Um, and we will go into the, um, to the text. But before we go into the text, I'm going to go to the um, Brown Driver Briggs Hebrew English Lexicon. And we're going to look at the, the definitions of that. I advise you, brothers and sisters, to get this if you want to learn Hebrew. It's a very good resource, a good tool that may aid you in, um, in your Hebrew understanding. So again, we'll look at this verb here, which is the one we already went over, which is Rabbah, which is right here, Rabbah. Notice that second root radical is a bet. Okay, and it means to be or become much, uh, many, great, to multiply, so forth. So um, that is um, what we already went over. So let's just go to what appears also in the, um, I don't know why I have that one marker in here. Look at the, here we go. Now notice here, you have the same resh, the first um, root, is the same and the last root is the same. But when you change this, if there was an error when they were, or they couldn't read it from the written materials smudged or something and they put in a bet, but suppose it would have been a delet that's here. Now it has a different meaning. Have dominion to rule to dominate. All right? Have rule to dominate, have dominion. All right, now let's, because that now, it, it, it's the same verb. I mean, it's a verb just like the other one was. Uh, but just let's look at two or three examples that may give us more insight um, on that particular one. So let's go to the book of Ezekiel and we'll find something. Let's go into the King James Version first, chapter 34, and we'll read verse 4, which is right here. This is Ezekiel chapter 34 and verse 4. All right, it says here that the disease have you not strengthened, neither have you healed that which was sick, neither have you bound up that which was broken, neither have you bought again that which was driven out, neither have you sought that which was lost, but with force and with cruelty have you ruled them. Okay, again, don't pay, this is a total different subject matter that it's talking about, but we want to pay attention to the verb and see how it's used. Have you ruled them? So now let's go to the Hebrew text and to see if that word um, for ruled or have dominion over them. And here it is, here we're in the book of Ezekiel. All right, we're in the book of Ezekiel and we're in chapter 34 and verse four here. This is toward the end of that scripture and notice here, you have that um, radiatin, 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 which is a root word. Again, you have the, the second masculine plural at the end, but since it's not an imperative, notice when I was mentioning before that normally when you second person, um, second masculine plural, um, without being a direct command, you have the TM, just like in the Watim. Um, meaning the uh, independent pronoun for second masculine plural that you have. This is normally there. So this is it. This is um, with the D, the delet. So you have the R, the D, and of course the He has been substituted because you're going with the plural with the Yod here, meaning um, uh, second masculine plural. But that's a whole other thing. I just want to let you know that this is the same root for rule and have dominion, just like the scripture said. Now, let's take a look at another scripture. Let's look at Isaiah 14 and 2. Let's look at Isaiah 14 and 2 and see what that has to say. Isaiah 14 and 2 is, where is it at? There's Isaiah, is 13, 
14 and 2. And again, this is Isaiah 14 and verse 2. And you all probably know this scripture very well, 14, 1 and 2. Um, you probably enjoy this subject matter. But it says, And the people, meaning the children of Israel, uh, the people shall take them and bring them into their place, and the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Most High, or Yahweh, or Yahuwah, or Yahweh, how you would pronounce that, for servants and handmaids. And they shall take them captives, whose captives they were, and they shall rule over their oppressors. Again, have dominion to rule. That should also be what? Um, that should be Rudu, right? Rada, that is, Rada. So let's just see if that's what it says in the scripture. Let's go to Isaiah. And we're just making some comparison and going back to the scriptures. And we're going to 14 and 2. There's Isaiah 14, the book of Isaiah 14. And aha, there you have it. The same thing. Now, this is um, this is given a direct command. This is an imperative. Because you, how you know that? Because you have the the wu at the end, and you have warada, waradu. That is waradu, waradu, which again is having dominion and ruling. So, could that have been the case? That it should have been in Genesis chapter 9, verse 7. One last piece of evidence that I think that really has me convinced is when we look at the book of um, Genesis, since we are talking about Genesis and go to Better Sheep chapter 1 and 28. So we are looking at Better Sheep chapter 1 and verse 28. Now, notice this in the same context as what we were reading in Genesis chapter 9. It, it, except in chapter 9, it was talking about Noah and, 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 and going about and filling the earth and multiplying and, and so forth. And here we have in verse 1, he's speaking after he had created man, right? In verse 28, and it says, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish. So it didn't repeat and say and multiply again. It just says and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. OK, so again, this should be just a direct command. We should see an imperative with that why at the end of that verb. But let's see if that verb is a. Rabbah, or if it is a rada, one meaning multiply, saying it again, or if it is saying have dominion over the fish and everything that moves on the earth. So let's go to back to the, the Hebrew text and go back to Bereshit chapter one. It should be fairly easy to find. And let's see what it says here. One and twenty eight. Let's see where are we at here. Are we in one? And there we go here. This is um, chapter one. And this is coming from verse number 28. We see it starts off at 28. And we have some of the same language that we had before. Uh, Tim, remember that? And you, Elohim, meaning that God said to you. Um, and he said, we have more. Um, and Lahim, which is to them. And anyway, Paru, we see some of the same words we had before. But then we get to this one. We see here the Wuradu. See that? The Wuradu, which means to have dominion and to rule over. So that gives me enough um, support and evidence that that may be the case when we look at Genesis chapter 9. Um, verses 7 that that may have been or should have been um, Uradu so the word of the Most High has not changed it just may be whatever script they was getting that from from the ancient text that they translated how they wrote a um, 
repeated Uradu, Urabu, instead of putting in Uradu, meaning to dominate. So anyway, I don't want to lose you, um, but that's all I wanted to bring out. And that's, again, talking about the imperative. So you can see the difference in imperative. This is given a direct command because he gave this to mankind. Um, an imperative, this is what you do. Versus when we looked in Ezekiel, that was just in a general form where he used a, a different uh, pronominal suffix at the end um, to represent the second masculine plural. So um, anyway, that is going to do it for me. And if you have any questions, comments, or any other such, you know how to hit me up. And blessings unto you. And I would say shalom, shalom.